Okay. I think we're on. All right. Um, so welcome everybody to the first international online lecture in 2020 um, by the Leibniz University Hannover hosted by the Faculty of Architecture and Landscape Science. Um, this event will be moderated by the Institute of Design and Architecture representation. Um, sorry for being 15 minutes late. Um, unfortunately, uh, we do this, uh, it's, a, it's a, like a new thing and we unfortunately um, it took us a little longer to set up. Um, my name is Tobias Nolte and I'm joined by Mirko Becker who is professor for um, digital methods in architecture. Um, why do we have obviously the, the online lecture today is um, with the outbreak of COVID-19 and basically the cancellation of all uh, physical teaching at the Leibniz University. Um, we at the Institute really thought we should, um, instead, of, instead of sort of like complaining about the situation, we should really fully embrace um, the current situation um, and um, really consider the situation we are in as, a, as an innovation accelerator in a way. Um, and consider the more positive aspects of this, of the positive aspects of online teaching and what we can learn from it. Um, so, you know, while um, um, when the whole sort of outbreak hit, we decided to um, um, not only change the way we teach, but also sort of like change the content we teach at the, at the Institute. Um, embracing film and sound design um, as new, as like, so like means of architectural representation um, while and when students can't be physically in a room. Um, embrace, let's say, limited means of production, um, you know, an inkjet printer to explore the vocabulary, um, the repertoire of architectural forms such as paper surfaces, while students don't have access to um, 3D printing through CNC routing and model shops. Um, we distributed VR glasses, um, to um, experiment and explore virtual co-ideation, co-creation by meeting, discussing, and presenting in virtual space as avatars. And um, I feel like the main um, aspects why we host this um, online lecture today is really a change in um, the potential reach students at the university and uh, Leibniz University in Hanover can have due to the COVID outbreak. So um, while usually, you know, a lecture would be defined as um, students living in Hanover coming to a, a building in Hanover and listening to people that either travel or live in Hanover. Um, now we really have the opportunity to um, have a much broader and actually like really like global reach and um, invite people to Hanover to an online um, lecture series um, that don't have to be physically present um, present and really um, um, extend the reach of um, voices we can, we can hear. Um, so the first iteration of this, um, we thought it would be super interesting, um, not only to hear uh, one voice, but actually pair the um, presentation by an internationally renowned architect um, with um, an advanced fabricator to talk about projects, both from a design and a fabrication perspective. Um, so um, there is Amin Taha of uh, Group Works, uh, of Group Work London, and Luc Tamborero from Atelier Romeo um, in Paris and Trani, Italy. Um, Amin Taha was actually born in East Berlin um, to an Iraqi mother and Sudanese father who marooned after their respective countries underwent counter revolutions. Uh, settled in the UK where Amin studied architecture in Edinburgh before working for Zaha Hadid and setting up an independent studio from which group work developed as an employee ownership trust. The practice group work has international recognition for its build work, including multiple Royal Institute of British Architects national awards, Reba Sterling Prize 2017 shortlist and two EU Mies Awards 2019 nominations. Um, on both his build and research projects, Amin and group work 
collaborated extensively with Atelier Romeo, an advanced stone cutting company from Paris, France, and Trani in Puglia, Italy. Um, um, so we are also joined by Luke Tamborero. He is a board director of Atelier Romeo. Um, and as a research associate and PhD student, Luke researched extensively um, the, at the architecture school Paris Malaquais at the Laboratoire Géométrique Structure Architecture. In 2008, he was awarded the Eduardo Benvenuto Prize by the Eduardo Benvenuto Association for his research on stereotomy. Um, and both Amin and Luke will present recent projects and innovations in stone cutting um, in, their joint uh, in, their, in their joint presentation, Stereotomy at the Edge of Architecture. So the way how we uh, want to go about this is, um, you know, while we are here um, in, a, in a Zoom uh, meeting, we are being broadcast to, uh, to a YouTube live stream. And um, both Mirko and I, we will be um, watching the live stream and um, if there are any questions in the audience, um, we will sort of like bring them in. We, um, feel free to interrupt if you have questions. Um, so we would start with a presentation of um, Amin and then um, uh, um, continue or like have a more dialogue um, with um, Luke. So feel free to um, sort of like, uh, interact and Post questions, comment in the um, in the YouTube um, chat section. So please help me welcome Amin and Luke. Hello, nice to meet Hello. everyone. If anyone's watching, do you do you want me to share the presentation yes. now? Yes, please. Please okay. do. I, I think I need to stop. I need I to think stop you do, sharing. Yeah. Then, uh, okay. We need to go. Ahead. Uh, and I think. I need to press control L. Is that right? Control L. Yeah. Okay. I think that's about right. I think you need to still enter the full screen mode. All right. <clears throat> how do we, how would, <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> control L. I think once you're on sharing. Oh, there we go. Oh, Is that, yeah. that's perfect. sorry, I, I just didn't press the button, did I? Okay. Hello, everyone. Okay. We're group work. And I'm going to split our talk into two parts and integrate uh, Luke into it at some point, if not just at the end. So etymology of architecture is really um, uh, uh, a paraphrase from Gottfried Semper. Uh, and it's really the idea that uh, where, does, where does design and architecture originate? Um, and these are questions that are raised initially by this chap, who is Giorgio Vasari. So he, he's obviously an arch artist and architect in his own right, working in the 16th century and is mostly well known for his work with the Medicis, uh, their, their bridges in Florence, but also the, the book that's effectively the first history of art and architecture book called The Lives of the, the Most Excellent Artists, Sculptors and Architects. And he, of course, um, included himself amongst um, all the ones we, we, we know. Uh, now, the difference between his book and those that came later is that it's very anecdotal. It's obviously not the discipline of history of, of art and architecture as we know it today, but it's quite important because essentially what he's doing is giving you a bio biography of each artist, sculptor, and uh, an architect, uh, specifically about their process. That was actually, some of you might recognize as a, that as a German and not Florentine, uh, but specifically about their process. So they became apprentice to somebody. While they were apprentice, they learned their craft, but they might have innovated. They might have innovated in a way that made them their own masters, of, as it were, before they became commissioned and, uh, and deserving to be included in his book. So in essence, uh, his, his uh, taxonomy of, uh, of, uh, of art and architecture is the idiosyncratic process style of, of each of those individuals. It's not a homogenous period. Uh, now, that, that book essentially sat on shelves in universities and, uh, and uh, uh, private houses for about 200 years as the official history of art and architecture. 
until Johann Winkelmann um, um, uh, uh, wrote um, uh, uh, Art and Architecture of the Ancients in the, um, in the uh, 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 18th century, mid 18th century, so roughly 200 years later. So this is obviously the period of enlightenment. He's, the, he's much more, if you like, empirical. He's effectively a proto-archeologist, uh, uh, anthropologist, historian. Uh, 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 off on his tour of, uh, of uh, Rome, Greece, Egypt, etc. And uh, mapping, uh, properly mapping what he finds and then projecting up uh, uh, whether they're ruins or, or actual uh, remaining structures. Now, the key difference between Vasari and Winkelmann is that Vasari is an observer. He's not an artist, he's not a sculptor, he's an observer. He's mapping. Uh, he's redrawing, but then coming up with rational, rationalizations of how these products came about. So Vasari might be telling you about the process and explaining how the process derived a product. In other words, uh, the, the artists and architects, their craft, their, their development and innovations in their craft, uh, producing the product, one comes before the other. Well, Winkelmann is an observer. So he's mapping and then rationalizing how these came about. And the difference between the, ultimately the, the resulting difference is that we have then really about 200 years of his um, inadvertent errors. So he's, 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 he's pulling out the ground stones that he thinks are pure white marble. Uh, and of course, we, we, I mean, really, they knew about 100 years later that they were actually painted. But the convention uh, has, 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 was maintained all the way up to the recent past that the Greeks and Romans on the whole uh, delighted in, in whiteness and white marble stones uh, uh, in architecture and their sculptures. Now, where does this lead to? Well, ultimately it leads to a, a culture that at some point uh, understands architecture as, as an image, uh, uh, an image which with a rationalization. Now, Winkelmann rationalized the Greek is better than all the others better than Roman, better than Egyptian, because of the Greek he idealized as a republic, a democratic republic, and therefore having a, uh, therefore producing in his mind better proportion, better, better, purer, whiter architecture and art. Uh, 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 this is ultimately then fed back into the education system. And at some point, uh, what architects and archi uh, artists are doing, and specifically arch architects in our case, is then looking at that image and reproducing that image under a style. So they're not, they're not uh, um, uh, uh, apprenticed and developing a skill as such. They're, they're effectively reproducing an image. And that's something that every generation of architects struggles with and they challenge. Now, they don't necessarily come out to the other end of that challenge with a particularly um, alternative answer. Really, the dialectic continues oscillating between one style and another. And of course, in England, we had uh, Ruskin and others that then said, okay, let's drop the Greek. It's pagan. Uh, we're, we're promoting Christianity and Christianity is really celebrated with the Gothic in Europe. So let's drop Greek and pick up Gothic. So we have a Gothic revival. And it's really another style that is uh, conflated with, uh, with, with uh, a political and, and religious identity. Semper, similarly, uh, but Semper is at least trying. He's, uh, he's, he's suggesting that ultimately the etymology of all design is not a surface conflation with politics, but actually uh, the, the, what he describes, the joining, binding, and completing of, uh, of architecture and art and, and the applied arts. Specifically, he starts with chairs and, and stools uh, and, and, and how that, how that forming into interconnection of those materials uh, uh, um, is completed, i.e. It's, it's, it's celebrated in a way so after one or two iterations, three or four, it becomes formalized and becomes the decoration uh, uh, of a particular culture, as it were. So he's seeking for a new culture. That doesn't, that doesn't come about until maybe a generation or two later, all the way through Wagner and then eventually the Bauhaus. And ultimately, you know, this is the sort of thing that Winkelmann is missing, that the, that, that, that the buildings he's looking at, are, and this is what Wagner, uh, uh, Semper is eventually understanding, that the buildings he look at, he's looking at have an etymology, they have a tectonic etymology, 
as a that's abstracted in stone from an original um, timber 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 um, uh, construction. And of course, the danger of understanding architecture as image only is that your effectively architecture becomes two dimensional, and uh, especially today. That effectively means you're releasing your responsibility of how you uh, put put buildings together to those people who who invent products, and those products might be paper thin representation of structure that used to be the integration of architecture and structure and and those crafts that 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 that, um, that, that form the architecture that are, that is the etymology of architecture. You might ask, so what? Who cares? Uh, well, um, perhaps on very practical levels, there's a, there's a reason for that, for, for that reintegration. And we'll come across that in some of the buildings we're talking about. Uh, um, so I won't elaborate now, but let's jump to one now. So at one end of the spectrum of some of the buildings I'm going to present um, is, uh, is what's called, uh, in this country, it's called effectively developer housing. Very inexpensive, uh, equivalent of social housing. Um, typical of, uh, of most of England um, in the Victorian, Georgian and Victorian period, uh, the industrial period. Uh, so you can see here within one generation, this particular part of London went from partly open fields to, to very dense um, development. Now that was done with effectively pattern books, uh, very simple brick facades, front and rear, um, and brick party walls and timber structures in between. That's very effective. Today, we, we, we conserve those streets. It's very simple, it's produced very rapidly. Um, it, it's actually uh, tectonic in the terms of that, that those walls are actually holding up the whole building. None of them are, are, are just uh, stuck on facades. Uh, and there's an uh, integration of structure and the architectural dressing, if you like, to do that. So our, our question was, can we do that today? Can we produce a model that is, is a highly inexpensive to, to put together, but in some ways has the, the dramatic ability to, 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 to be um, reproduced several times down a street, a whole street or a neighborhood, but at, at the same time has some charm in it. Now the charm comes in those, in those previous um, uh, examples in small amounts of detail that are applied. So here is our solution. We'd, we'd worked with uh, uh, some timber suppliers, this is ultimately CLT, uh, who together we effectively realized we could strip the building down to its bare elements. Superstructure is the CLT, and then a, a skin, a weathering skin on the outside. Now the challenge is that even in this country, what we tend to do is we hold up bricks on every floor with, um, with shelf angles. Now that means the weight of those bricks is held back to the superstructure and the superstructure has to get heavier. The foundations get heavier. Uh, so you're spending money and energy and material cost on holding up bricks that ultimately are still made as they were several hundred years ago, perfectly capable of holding themselves up several stories. So the solution is the superstructure stands alone. The brick envelope supports itself, but it has to be stopped falling into the street. Uh, so this is very much a, a sort of straightforward, simple plan of that. Uh, I'd like to think that all of you as architects would probably follow the same principle. It's very narrow, there's light at the front and back, bedrooms at the back, staircase in the middle, and a large bed, um, living room, kitchen, dining, facing the street. Um, now, this is the key, really. So what we can see here, and I might be able to actually annotate um, while we're talking, what you see here is, um, is uh, the CLT floor plate, engaged directly with the wall, becoming the roof, and they're all exposed on the interior. So there's no plasterboard lining, no paint or anything else. The timber is the superstructure and internal finish. So that reduces the cost of the building by roughly 25%. Uh, now the brick wall stands alone and it's allowed to therefore move independently because there are no shelf angles at every floor holding that up. If there were, then the brick and timber would want to move independently. You need expansion joints, um, more material, more cost, uh, more carbon in, in the embodied structure as well. So I'm just going to clear that drawing before moving on. If I've managed to do that, if you bear with me. I, have to, I think I have to go back to the mouse after annotating. Yes. 
Okay. Okay, I think we're going to spend uh, the next half hour on one drawing. <laughs> okay, how do we how do we stop annotating? Does anybody know? No, no, no. Uh, can you maybe? Oh, there we go. Sorry oh, about that. Okay. I think I went annotate. Because, <laughs> right. So um, I th that's the interior, all exposed CLT. Um, some um, areas of detail, as I was discussing earlier, that sort of um, is, uh, some of the neighborhood is a bit arts and crafts. So there are some tactile details that, that you see every day. And then the, the, the further sort of domestic interiors. So you see nothing, nothing, uh, nothing extra added to that. And the balcony is all offset from one another, so you allow some social engagement between neighbours up and up and below yourselves. So if you uh, if you wish, you can stay private, but you can also interact. Now the lesson that we learned from that is that there's a drop in construction costs by about twenty five percent. Now that, strictly speaking, on that project, the market rate will will sell those uh, those units. At the market rate, it won't drop the price of those units just because you've saved that construction cost. Uh, now, what that what we what we realise that would mean is that the 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 structure of how the uh, funding and, and the market works is that the, that would mean land values would increase. So, as architects, we might be innovating for the purposes of um, creating lower and lower cost housing and construction. But ultimately, if you leave it to the market, the market will obviously sell at its rate. So, really, all you're doing is increasing land value by saving the construction cost unless you work with what we over here call a social uh, landlord uh, who already owns the, the land, as it were. Okay, by contrast, this is a project in, um, in, um, in, in central London and Bayswater, uh, uh, opposite Hyde Park and Kensington Gardens. It's one of the last end of block plots looking for a mansion house. Now, what we tend to do as well as the tectonic. So we're obviously interested in tectonic to express the architecture. But by contrast, sometimes there are other um, uh, elements that, 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 that might, might um, take precedent. So here, uh, our, our site is directly adjacent to this odd oddity in what's otherwise a very plain uh, series of streets. This oddity, as it turns out, is actually uh, the um, the house built by Muse Davis by the Prince of Wales at the time. So this is Queen Victoria's son for his lover, Lily Langtry, who was a famous actress um, and singer. Now that, that is a fine building by Muse Davis. Uh, we're, we're, we're constructing next door to it. Uh, we have all sorts of environmental issues, um, uh, uh, noise issues, privacy issues. Uh, and while we're undertaking that standard architectural um, uh, development, design development. We're also doing this sort of interest, the, the research in the, in the neighborhood in case there's something interesting that might inspire us, that might um, influence the design. I won't take you through the entire design, but one of the experiments that was running parallel with that was that imagine if Muse Davis uh, um, were able to finish the, uh, the entire block in their typical way. So they built the Ritz Carlton, the RIC Club, uh, and various other buildings like that in central London. So was, this is just imagining it. But as we were, as we were doing that and, and laying out the plans, and you can see it's a fairly rational plan, it occurred to us we have, we have both uh, a great deal of solar gain coming to the, to the building that we need to deal with, with with some sort of solar shading. Privacy issues that can be dealt with, again, with a screen, either internal or external. Environmental issues, could we take advantage of... Um, um, winter gardens, and it suddenly occurred to us that the, 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 the density of that screen we were having to create is essentially um, uh, coming to quite a dense facade. And why, why does this imagined um, uh, um, um, extrapolation of the Muse Davis um, scheme not become that facade, except here as a sort of ghost imagined facade in, in the form of a uh, uh, one millimeter perforated brass screen. So it's that Middle Eastern meshrabia that acts as privacy, <laughs> but 
but developed as um, uh, uh, with a certain density to, to, to limit the amount of solar gain, but is also activated in, in parts. So um, um, certain parts of it, you can, you can wind a handle and they open up. So really the, the tectonics there speak for themselves internally. It's a very simple superstructure, but beyond that, then it's this theme of this um, screen that, behave, that, that undertakes three separate solutions as it were, including ultimately aesthetic. Now that, that led to um, uh, uh, some thoughts on nostalgia ultimately. So the, because one of the things we found about that particular project was people very much liked it because it looked old, obviously. Um, and uh, there's plenty of projects where you come across situations where people would like to just rebuild what they imagine would have been an older building that stood on the side. Now that's very prescient at the moment uh, because we found the, the, the motivations for building in that old way are, are, are a sort of nostalgia, a stripping back of, um, of a reality of the past, an idealization of the past, um, effectively the equivalent of monument building. So this is a site in, 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 in a part of, uh, not far from here actually, a part of London that had um, uh, got bombed during the war and it laid, actually laid empty until a few years ago when our client bought it and ran, in, ran a small competition amongst uh, architects of how to infill that site. And we thought, well, actually we're tackling the idea of nostalgia. Uh, we are working with uh, some concrete and uh, terracotta uh, casting, faience casting um, 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 specialists. And it occurred to us that these materials don't want to be perfect. They, uh, the, what, you, what you're actually creating is, is a perfect mold. So the mold has to be carved in perfection the way it's then put together has to be perfect to stop any leakages and imperfections and that. And obviously uh, the sequence of those molds have to be perfect. And then ultimately you mix it uh, while you're pouring it to create that perfection. And then when you pull the cast off, you find the imperfection. Uh, and then uh, 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 most people want it to be perfect. So a great deal of the repairs have to be done. So we thought this is actually uh, the ideal material from which to cast a mold of what used to be there uh, and allow those imperfections to speak of the flawed um, idealizations in, in, in all monuments, as it were, memory, the flawed memories and monuments. So really this is a, a, a hollow cast of, uh, of, of what we think was there, or what is remembered of that past with um, the new occupation then rudely cutting into that. So our contemporary lives, as it were, cutting in cutting through that, that mold. Uh, and here we're using UCL's um, robots to essentially uh, carve our three-dimensional model into um, recycled expanded polystyrene and test whether this idea works, especially to, to budget, of course. Uh, it actually came out a lot better than we imagined. So we had to deliberately kick the machines here and there to ensure that there were enough flaws uh, and then deliberately um, bring um, some of the, um, the molds on the wrong day and turn them upside down. So, to, so they're subtle, they're maybe too, too many subtle moves as opposed to making it too obvious. But uh, uh, yeah, it's full of those sort of deliberate um, efforts to, to celebrate the um, imperfection as it were internally as well as externally. I'm going to rush through this because ultimately I want to integrate, uh, bring, bring Luke on board. So this is the last one before we get Luke on board. And really what, you're, what we're talking about up to this stage is really how to, how to, um, how to allow the tectonics to influence the, the design process and ultimately bring something hopefully new about, um, as opposed to the reverse, which is understanding architecture as a style, a surface, an image, and how do I reproduce that? Uh, so this is a competition in Sofia we won some time ago um, for uh, a metro station, uh, a bus uh, interchange and, and park, a connection to some local parks. 
and to the outside um, uh, ring park, as it were, that goes around the city. So it had to perform those three purposes. Now, we all know what um, uh, metro stations and um, airports infrastructure can look like. There's a language to them. Um, so that's, it's quite easy to fall into that language, as it were. Uh, from the outset, we thought, well, let's, let's talk to the engineer about the basics of, um, of uh, metro building. They come in two ways. Either they're tunneled or it's called cut and fill. So you're cutting a trench, putting a roof on and filling back on top. Now, the, 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 the problem with cut and fill is that you're, you're spending about 30% of your, your budget on the, on the temporary structure. So you're cutting your trench. You have to stop your trench collapsing in on itself build a roof, a temporary roof, cast your roof, then take all that temporary structure away. Uh, 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 and then you're left with your, 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 um, your hole, as it were, your, your, your cavern. Uh, we realized with the engineer that if we pile and then we, um, we, we, we mold the top surface of the earth, as it were, that's left between the piles to become the, the, the formwork for the, uh, for, for the slab, uh, then we can pour that onto the earth uh, leave a hole, a series of holes to, 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 to throw some diggers down and dig out underneath. So we do away with the temporary piles altogether. And that effectively fed back into the, the expression of the architecture because we realized, well, actually, the language of what's then internal is really just the, the structure, the structure that's formed by the earth. Um, so it's a subterranean structure that's, uh, that's, uh, that's created. So that fed back into the connection with the landscape. We realized, well, perhaps the landscape is that journey into the metro station. So it becomes a walk along the landscape route to the local parks as well as to the ring park. And then that eventually brings us into uh, a fissure in the landscape that is the journey into the underworld, as it were. So ultimately, the, the, the language of that architecture was one of subterranean um, uh, caverns formed by the landscape. And then the, um, the, the platforms, et cetera, almost like mining technology props with, with platforms supported by those props. Okay, so Luke was working with us on this very prosaic building, again, near Hyde Park for a family who wanted to renovate a 1950s house, uh, strip out all everything that had been done since, since the 50s, 70s, 80s, et cetera, and start again. Uh, and one of our, our, our moves was to take out the staircase, which effectively made the whole house quite dark, uh, open it up to a skylight and put a new staircase in that went from a new basement all the way to the top. Uh, and we, we um, this is from inside the garden back to the main house. And you can see the staircase to the left and obviously lots of travertine and brass and cherry wood. Uh, but the key for us working with Luke uh, and, and lots of um, cabinetry makers uh, was, um, before we get to Luke, <laughs> some lovely bathrooms there with um, brass shower curtains, all in wood by yacht, uh, yacht specialists. Um, and here's our subterranean area that's cast in concrete bush hammered uh, and then leading to that staircase. So uh, uh, what we realized when we were talking with, uh, with, with Luke was um, uh, what tends to happen today is that we build staircases with steel stringers and then place stone within them. And our question was uh, back in the 1980s, I think it was in this country, uh, Price and Myers engineers rediscovered how Georgian staircases, medieval staircases were built because it was a bit of a mystery to people in, in that period, 70s and 80s, how on earth these what appeared to be very thin pieces of stone held themselves up. And uh, working with Luke and others, we realized, well, they effectively uh, reminded us that there's a, there's a system called part cantilevered, part reciprocal resting of those treads. So they're part bedded into the wall, but partly resting on the next tread below. And that transfer of load can occur in a spiral or he helix down to the basement or ground level. Uh, and of course, while you're deciding which stone you're using, you're also realizing you're cutting and wasting a great deal of stone. So our first experiments here, this is the staircase upside down in the yard, is to see how, how little wastage we could, uh, we could um, uh, uh, get away with. 
So really what they're doing here is pulling out large blocks from the quarry, uh, cutting them uh, out of those blocks um, uh, uh, inter in an interlocking fashion and unfolding those so they then marry up together and do that part reciprocal load that we were talking about. Um, this is a typical block. Uh, and while we were staring at this, we were thinking, my God, that's just a lovely piece of stone. You know, um, we know so many stone buildings in London that, um, that use cladding. Uh, surely this could be a beam or, 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 a, um, or, a, or a column, which brings me on to Clerkenwell. Um, uh, now, Luke, uh, before we go on to Clerkenwell, you might want to just, do you, you want to jump? Sh shall I just leave the slides on, um, on Caroline so you can explain a little bit of, uh, about that? The, uh, yeah, I mean, thank you for, for that. Um, yeah, in my next explanation, I make a development of the, of the techniques and, and the thing we, we share together to think how to make this form. And yeah, I mean, only on this point, it was the, the first work we make uh, together. And, and what I developed after that is that it's very interesting to, to share some techniques to find a new design. That's what we, we do on, uh, on this staircase, working on the West Stage and, and, uh, and a new way to make this rough structure and surface. Um, yeah, I will develop this in the okay in your in, in the, the next, next part. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try and rush. I'll try and rush to that because I think we're going to run out of time otherwise. Uh, so essentially, I mean, this is really an old medieval type uh, uh, of, uh, way of building that minimizes the amount of stone and other material, steel, etc. And really, that's the lesson we learned onto the next project, because uh, at Clerkenwell Close, um, which is roughly um, in that sort of top right hand uh, left hand corner is a site where an abbey used to be, a Norman abbey, uh, which, is the, 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 uh, um, uh, which has pretty much disappeared now. And the only thing that remains are the internal streets and bounding streets, as it were. Now, on, on, in this particular area, because it was outside the city walls, it was actually um, outside the strict laws of the city, as it were, and therefore it had this um, uh, reputation for radicalism. So initially part of the printing presses, the sort of radical printing presses, um, uh, and lots of change, lots of instigated change that effectively meant that it was co constantly being redeveloped. Uh, these are some of the um, personalities, as it were, who, who have actually worked in buildings directly adjacent to us. These are the buildings that were demolished to make way for our site, Oliver Cromwell's um, old house, uh, and some of the adjacent sites even older than that, all replaced eventually by the, both the Georgians and the Victorians and more recently by, um, by, uh, uh, by um, the 1970s. And that was our site. And our first, first um, uh, uh, idea for that was to perhaps allude to some of that medieval structure, pre-Norman, pre-Stone, uh, where we took a piece of engineering software and worked with a metal fabricator to, to take, um, it's a proper piece of engineering parametrics as it were, because what you do is you take the, the, the flow of, of the transfer of load of the facade that holds up the floor plates down to the ground. And if you look carefully, there's a nodal point every time um, beam and column meet with a, with a, with a cross bracing that, that will punch the facade out or push it back in. Now, as it, happened, as it happens, our local planners preferred stone. And uh, stone in this country is pretty much built like this. So it's uh, pieces of stone that are clad on. And we thought, well, this is, it seems like a, a vast amount of effort to, to, to put a superstructure up either in concrete or, or steel, fireproof it, waterproof it, uh, uh, environmentally enclose it in terms of insulating it and, and uh, stop the cold bridging and then create these special clamps that have to be glued onto the stone and so on. Why can't we go back to the method that Luke and others were using uh, for, for the staircase? So we visited some quarries and quickly found that these master blocks are extracted fairly inexpensively, um, that then are subdivided pretty easily. I mean, some of these don't come out so cleanly from the quarry, so they still have to be hand carved out but they come with three, diff three minimum types of finish. And these are perfectly, to us, they were perfectly acceptable. Why, why polish them 
why make them planar? You occasionally have fossils and ammonite shells and uh, crystal uh, pockets in there. Um, we put this together with, with that team to test how beam and column might come together to then uh, fix to floor plates and become an exoskeleton. So what you're looking at here is uh, floor plates that are on temporary props before these beams and columns come in are fixed to the uh, floor slabs and then temporary props taken out, but left effectively as a quarry finished. Now it turns out that um, doing that is, uh, saves 95% of the embodied carbon. Had we made the building in either steel or concrete and clad it in, um, in, in stone, and it's actually 25% uh, of the cost so it saves 75% of the cost had we done it in, in concrete or steel and then again clad it. Um, so those are arguments really for, for why you ought to integrate your, your, your craft knowledge through Luke, who will explain further, um, uh, as opposed to just saying, I, I can represent an architecture through a two-dimensional drawing and somebody else will tell me how I can get that two, through two-dimensional drawing to turn into a three-dimensional reality by clipping on my two-dimensional idea, as it were. So those are some of the technical details. Uh, you can ask me about if you're really, if you're really interested. That is, that's it in its context. I'll rush through these because Luke needs an opportunity to elaborate further. So that's a mixture of the three different uh, finishes which to us were perfectly acceptable as, uh, as telling the story of the quarry master as well as the stonemasons and some of the more narrative carvings in the gardens that tell the story of the history of the site. Internally, it, how it's finished, so very simply finished and again with the same cabinetry makers. And then the, uh, the, the, the sort of biodiverse garden that is actually a blue roof, an intensive blue roof, an intensive green garden at the top. That, that effectively means that instead of water attenuation and pumps, if you place four trees up there, they will absorb the annual rainfall. This is another one of Luke's projects that he's doing, which is now twice the height in, in, in the same exoskeleton of stone uh, in central London with hopefully a CLT interior now, the, the, i.e. floor plates and, and cores. The combination of that meaning that um, the building is actually carbon negative. Carbon negative to the same degree, i.e. so negative, that the equivalent building in concrete, it, it, add them together, they'd be neutral. Uh, this is Luke's invention. I should leave. Do you, do you want to talk about this, Luke, or do you want to talk about it in your, in your, um, in your, uh... we, we can have a few words and, and yeah, I, I have yeah. a, after this, okay. we, we, we can. So Luke invented this product, which is effectively like a cross laminated stone, which we, uh, we, 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 we had a, a experiment with to turn into um, its sort of standalone structure in Venice a couple of years ago. You can just see there. It's basically taking a waste stone that would otherwise just be left in the quarry and making use of it. So it's again, the same sort of um, idea of making use of waste and saving on the carbon footprint and how you can turn that into some something with its own structural uh, performance. I think that's it. Shall I unshare now? Um, stop share. Thank you very much. I mean, welcome, um, I wish I wish there, there could be like a, a round of applause now. <laughs> there, there might be one person, <laughs> one person listening if they haven't fallen asleep. No, there, 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 there are a few listening for sure. Okay. But um, right. unfortunately, we can't recreate the applause. Yeah. Um, Luke, do you want to? Um, yeah, I mean, thank you so much. It was a very uh, You're welcome, very um, insightful presentation. I'm, I'm, I'm always. Um, uh, I'm always impressed. Um, yeah, Luke, do you want to maybe elaborate on some of the um, so like more um, technical uh, and like stone, like basically process perspective to the project? Do you want to share your screen? Yeah, yeah. Let, let me do that. Share the screen. This one.
here we are. Cool. <laughs> Take it away. So, thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, yeah, let's start this, this slideshow. Um, so, we are um, <clears throat> we are a stone trade company and um, cabinet making, and we are based in Italy. Here in South Italy, and all the, all the board is French, and we we go there to take some sun and to have some good time in Puglia. So <laughs> it is a nice place to, for for living, and so we wish I mean there, and we have some nice time too. So yeah, we are stone mason and uh, what we can say about stone mason is we can imagine a medieval um, a trade who is working with uh, heavy tools and so and so and it is true it is still true but it is not only this we we, we make some advancement in mechanic also and, and so now we, now we also work with robots and the point is is in uh, our trade, what is very interesting is we have both techniques today together. I mean, the um, uh, normal craftsman uh, know how to work with tools because there is a quarry and the quarry, it's, uh, as I mean, show, it is a very um, natural uh, board. I mean, you are there, you have the nature in front of you and you have to extract to excuse to take something. And, um, and you do that with heavy tools. Um, as soon as we have this rude material, when you have it in, in your laboratory, you have to shape it to make it square if you need to make it square, or you can directly shape it to have something, something you, you need. And you can do that by robots, you can do that by hand, you have many, many ways to do it. And yeah, here, for example, we are um, we have a, a tool with uh, extractive tools for example for marble. So where you 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 can read that Zini, it is a um, it is a wire cut. So you see the 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 image with diamonds here, and um, you have a kind of road with uh, all together with some pearl of diamond, and this turn around and cut the stone. And you can use the same uh, tool in a workshop, for example. Here we, we are in our workshop and we are making something uh, for, it is a sculpture here for Anthony Gormley. And the thing is that uh, the architect would, or the artist would like to see uh, the effect of the extractive tool. So here you see, here we are on a quarry. So it is a different way than the, um, the one shown by I mean, this is a cutting way. I mean, you take the mountain and you cut by pieces and you make these pieces fall and you take these pieces and place in your, in your, in your workshop to make it again or on, on the building like um, I mean, do with a clerk and well. So, so there is different way to, to work. And it's very interesting because there is different stone. You can imagine there, there is uh, marble stone with lime and you have sandstone with, with, with um, the glass practically, and, and you have some lava stone or, or uh, volcanic stone, and all of them have different way of extraction, different advantage. And all of this need to be known to make an efficient work. What is very interesting is as soon as the craftsman people can share this knowledge with the architect, the designer, and artist, uh, it can be a way of inspiration. What is the impact of the of the of, of people on the earth, and how this can be um, shown and at real when you place it in an architecture or in an artistic point of view? So this is a clerk and way clerk way made by others and I, and and it is a pure example. I mean already. Um, told about this and it is a direct extraction by the direct tools used by the quarry and sent to the and then to the building site and that's a very interesting way for for working of course he has uh, he has a design coming with it and this is is, is one of the choice of the architect 
So here they just change the technique to, to show the natural bed, to um, show the extracting way, to show the, the sewing uh, faces. And the things you have to do there, you have to make a big, big uh, attention on the choice of the stone. Of course, you are on pillars and you are on lintel. So here, the, the craftsman will be really um, attend. He will be really careful on the choice where he, is, where he will extract in the quarry. I mean, you, 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 you have to choose a place and to do this work there because you know it's good and the nature didn't disturb um, in uh, any form. And so you, you, you can believe this is, is good. There is some way to make a verification of the state of the stone. I mean, this is a very hard stone. As soon as you smash on it, you make a song inspection, you know, more or less you have a percentage of um, defect can have the, the stone. If we have a crack inside and so and so, and maybe a crack also, can't be a problem and and if it is you have to take this away and 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 to take another block the point is why why can we build today with this it, it is due um it's very interesting the the advantage we have on computing today on um on calculation i mean it's it's uh when we work with, I mean, on different projects and with uh, engineers, it's true that uh, we we move with the, the weight, the thickness of stone very fast, because you, as you can see, we are not uh, really fixed in dimension and so and so. It is from here to here. And, and, and this is very useful to use a material who is not exact when you arrive on the building site. You, you, you have a, a mention, you have maybe this entity to this entity and you can use this stone. And after that, you have um, um, a permit of more or less material. And, and as soon as you build like this and you prevent um, your extraction, it's really an easiest way to extract the material to move the building in front of what offer you the earth. And, and this power of calculating is very important for um, this new building we see with, with these natural blocks, natural stone, not only on stone. I mean, it's, only, it's also true in uh, earth construction and so and so. So computing engineering is very, important for us in that moment. And I will show this also in, next to the, to the speak. So yeah, here are some, some details. I, uh, I mean, I mean, show where you have a saw just pass here and, and they let this kind of detail who are, who, are, who are true at the end. So this is another way of extraction. This is a granite. This granite extraction is more industrial. It's really, um, when you see Clackenwell, it is limestone. So limestone, where the nature makes some bed, makes some some high, different height, and so and so. That's the 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 granite is different. Different. It is directly coming from 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 under the earth, and it is a big ball of of material with different size of grain. As soon as you are you 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 make this. Um, this uh, stone soup, I will say, cold quickly, or it takes some time. So you have a different size of, of grain, but it is a big mass. So here, um, in uh, in granite, you will have some different way of extraction. But as you see, you have the same um, for the the wedge extracting. You you see on the photos that you have the wedge like in Clerkenwell. And uh, you have also the diamond wire. As you see, the face is, is pure and very large. And this is not a sew. It is a diamond wire who would do the work. So in that case, it is an Anthony Gormley sculpture. And it is really uh, near in the idea of Clark and Well. I mean, it is the reflection is, OK, uh, man touch the hearth. How can we place this in terms of excellences? In, in, in a sculpture. So the point is, we cut as we cut in, um, 
in query, we use the same tools. And here you see with the light, you have this uh, diamond wire I showed you before with, with cutting the surface. And I also use the flame because the flame can be used on granite to reveal the, the, the path of the diamond. So I reveal by different uh, techniques who are all from extraction. I reveal the way that we cut the stone immediately. After that, Anthony uh, asked for a very um, deep um, uh, expression of our knowledge. I mean, how can we place uh, this stone together only laying one on each other? And we need to ensure the, the, the stability of the structure. And we are working with gravity with very, very, very high uh, weight. As you see, the stone I have just above the head is, is a certain tone stone. So this one is lay, laying on little foot uh, with seven centi on the little of um, on the sheet of lead. So all the sculpture is made like this. I mean, we use a direct extraction, a very rude uh, um, way to treat the surface, but we use the human brain and craft to make the joint uh, not more than three millimeter. So the sense of the uh, of the sculpture is is this one, and the sense of the impact we have on the earth is this one. How can we use our uh, humanity to work with Earth? So in terms of um, planning everything, as I, as, as I told you before, the, compu the computer is something extremely important. I mean, the parametrization of, of uh, our design is really important. As soon as you make a, a building like we we see with um, with this stone, we can adapt the size in front of the extraction and the, the way where we'll place it on the building and so and so. And we mainly work with uh, this. Um, oh, I miss rivets there, but we all, all almost work only with this software. We work in rhinoceros and grasshopper for for yeah for designing and Dynamo and Revit for for the beam. So these are some examples of um, some design we make there, and I will show you the result after that. And yeah, we treat everything by, by 3D. And after that, um, as soon as the, the model is done, uh, we can share by, with engineers. We can make uh, also uh, retro engineering if it's necessary on some tests we made on some stone. And, and it is an excellent work to work at distance and to make it super precise. So here, for example, it is an Android we make in uh, Singapore and it is uh, all in massive stone. Here it is uh, the sing this Singapore staircase. We, we made, um, we made just something like four years ago, if I remember where we built everything in, in house to uh, respect all the design before placing it. So here are the result. So um, what I shown until now, it, it, it do not, it do not ask for, um, how can I say, a, a geometry culture, but the geometry culture, it is a part of our, of our knowledge. And it is a, a part we share with uh, Amintown carried in place. So the geometry knowledge, what is it? I mean, the geometry knowledge, it is stone masonry at the end don't need immediate uh, knowledge in geometry. I mean, if you make a, a building with two pillars and, uh, and um, one intel, um, that's quite okay in terms of geometry. But as soon as you go on different complicated way like uh, arch and you go until gothic for example you start to have some problem to make some assembly together and so and so and the geometry it is a it is a language and and some people speak this language not everyone and it was it was uh, a way for the trade to maintain their own position in front of other. Other means um, um, client, of course, 
and other means also architect as soon as they are and and architect some sometimes they are sometimes they are not and for example in the french gothic uh, period architect who was a, 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 a pure uh, craftsman maybe the better of all of them and become an architect and it is um, it is a time it is uh, Philibert Delorme in in uh, in France do this for the as the first. It, there is a time where where the architect exists, and Philibert Delorme was the one who want the architect to exist. He 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 he, he want leave the, this tradition, this Gothic tradition, where the craftsman are the architect and so and so, and you can imagine it's not very. Um, nice generally in terms of contract and so and so 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 you have a carte blanche i would say um from the the king to to um, open a new way for the architecture and this new way was based on the geometry i mean it was the the, the first one to reveal the trait d'architecture was uh, the geometrical knowledge used by craftsman to do some work and uh, to do the vault generally and so you have here on, on the screen um, an illustration of more or less what it is here it is a tromp and uh, you can see a cone enter into a cylinder and this make a curve and and this is part of the craftsman knowledge and he used exactly this to make a pass further. So here is the architect. And here is the pass further. I mean, in the Trump Dane, he uses invention to make something that craftsmen can't do, to, to, to apply on their own knowledge something plus, something that's it was not possible to do if you don't have this knowledge. And he based his legitimacy on this. And he said to everyone, if someone wants to know it, he come and we have a discussion about it. That's his writing on this book. So, so at the, uh, it is the first one. And this will never stop for at minimum of two century and a half. It will never stop at different periods. So the trait de la trompe d'année, it is, uh, it is a, a way to draw. It wasn't, wasn't existing before. And you have this, um, you, can, uh, you can see on this uh, architecture treatise and it, it explained and it, it is well explained in reality. It, it is only that you have to read the book and, and to have the knowledge, but it is something which bases legitimacy to reveal the, the secret, we'll say. So these are two of these main books he made. So Invention pour bien bâtir à petit frais with um, a carpentry invention with very, it is a milestone, it's extremely important in terms of, of um, technology. And you understand the, the reason why he makes this invention. I mean, there is a problem in forest, there is a problem of cost. I mean, it is a real invention of architect to make something possible again, to make vault, to make, at this period, it was a big, big problem of tree uh, finding. And uh, of course, the premier term de l'architecture with, uh, as you see on the, on the cover, you see all the design of tray, of tray de coupe de pierre uh, with what it revealed inside. Just, Sometime after it, I mean, there is the creation of the academy. So there is a non-official academy first. And after there is the official academy. And this means that there is um, a desire to pass from the arts mechanicae to the arts liberalist. And this desire is is um, uh, sustained and applied by the kingdom. I mean, they want architects are architect from 
liberalist, not not from Mechanica. And uh, and um, here there is the first result of this works. Here there is uh, example d'une manière universelle du Sieur Gérard Desargues, with a first uh, input of uh, mat uh, liber liberalist man. I mean, this is uh, he's an architect, he's, he's a, a, a mathematician, he's, um, uh, he make music also, uh, music treatises. I mean, he's someone who work on art and, and, and science. And he makes this book with four page, and uh, only four page for, for this one. And he returned Paris. I mean, I mean, craft mind gone crazy. And they, they go outside and they say, this one uh, will just don't speak again, don't exist. I mean, we, we, we will uh, show him that he don't know about what he is speaking and so, and so, and so, and so. And it was hard for him. I mean, at the end, he just uh, leave Paris and go to Lyon because it, it, it was too difficult. But the, the, he was not alone and someone as you see, is only three years after, like uh, Abraham Boss, who is, 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 is really an important person of the Academy of, uh, of the Painting. And I mean, that, that's someone. And, and he takes his knowledge, he makes a book, and he publishes this book. And so all the people can have access to a technique who is not um, a divulgation from the craftsmanship. It is a new invention. And of course, the craftsmanship will say, no, 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 this, this is not good, and so and so. But in reality, these books are studied and they are studied by liberal people. And in this book, in this work of Desargue, there is two steps. There is a first step with, um, um, how can I say, uh, to make it simple, it is a plain movement, which is quite easy to do in reality on, uh, on geometry, as soon as you know what you are doing. But it is the um, placement, the research of the angle diet, the solid angle pass, with something evident everywhere today, but it was not evident before. And the solid angle pass, what is it? It is the angle of a pyramid. As you see on the little image here, you have a plane A and a plane B, and it is the way to catch this angle. And this is the design to do it. Everywhere you are on the vault, everywhere. You don't have any limitation of the angle you want to cut. And this was understood really well by Gérard de Mansart. Gérard de Mansart began to be, at, uh, at later on this date, the, the architect of Louis, Louis, Louis XIV, Louis XIV. And uh, this is one of the, I must say, we, he was very young. Gérard de Mansart there was very young and uh, he placed this design uh, far away from Paris on Arles. And um, it is a really interesting design because it is near the same position. And it is, again, a, a use of knowledge by the architect to say and to show to craftsman his legitimacy. And on that vault with very flat, you can think, yeah, it is a technical, um, a technical, um, uh, I will say, uh, a technical challenge in terms of structure and so and so. You know, it is not really a technical challenge. It's really more a design challenge. At the end, there is all the building on on the of the of the municipality, and. Um, the the vault is on the first floor, so so there is a lot of power before to to move the wall, and if there is a one vault here, a second vault here, and there is a big hash with the wall on it, so it's really stable. The really interesting thing, 
and where is uh, the technical point uh, who allow uh, Jules de Mansart to show his superiority in front of the craftsman is all the curves are drawn. All the curves are not a consequence. Here you see there is um, um, a model we made uh, some, some years ago, and you see here the arch. The arch, it is a basket arch. It is a basket line. It is, it is not the resultant of this volume and this volume. And this is, is, is really a point, extremely an extremely important point. That means that he used this tool to do that because there is no, at this period, other knowledge to do that. And these don't have any limit. I mean, if we go to the geometry descriptive with, again, some years after, it is the same thing. I mean, it, it was not allowed to build, to be a builder. If you don't go to the geometry descriptive, you have to leave the old knowledge and to respect and, uh, and integrate the geometry descriptive. It, it was obligatory. And, and uh, at this period of the revolution, of course, the, the, the craftsman school was uh, closed and there is um, uh, a way and uh, intelligence to, um, to teach the same kind of geometry for every craftsman. And this I mean, work well until at, at the end, because uh, I mean, we have the geometry descriptive today everywhere. It is a way used the engineers at the revolution to impose to all the craftsmen the, uh, their own power, the new power of the revolution. So now let's take some, now we are making some story. Let's take some example of what we are doing in our, in our workshop, in our real craft. So I, I told you about uh, computering and so and so and so. And you see this design, this design, it, it was designed by computer, but in any case, I have the choice to do what I, what I like on my craftsman in front of the advantage I, I will find on, uh, on doing the pieces. And here it is a staircase and is made by hand. Many of the parts are made by hand because pieces are unique, pieces are very long to produce on, uh, on the computing way. And so we chose to have a direct attack by, by hand because our knowledge allow to save many time in certain case, not every time. I mean, if I have 1000 pieces who are the same to do, of course I will use robots because it is really annoying and, and it's not cost saving. But if I have one big complicated uh, piece to do and there is hour and hour of roboting, I will maybe sometime do it by hand or a part by machine and a part by hand. So here are the pieces we, you just saw before, and they are all do, done by hand. And we have no problem in reality in terms of, of technology to maintain uh, a geometry. Here we are on millimeter. And if you make uh, um, a computer work on such a piece and working for maybe two weeks on it, you can be sure that you are on millimeter, you are not on half millimeter because you, are, you have so many uh, work to do and you can have something. So it is only a choice on part of us. This is a result of this staircase. This was, was made in central London. It's uh, the architect's journey forward. And now we, are, we have a talk about the car in place staircase. So yeah, I mean, also if you want to, to join, then, then just just come and, and and yeah, we have to talk about it. So this is the first floor. This is the basement at the end. And at the at the basement, we make the the first test or test on crashing the stone. And you can see here you have a, a bombing here and 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 the inverse here because this stone and this stone are the, the same at the beginning. I show you here. The knowledge we, we use here is directly from the quarry. 
And because I mean, say, yeah, I really like this surface and I really like to save the material and I really like to, to obtain a direct effect. We, um, yeah, we invent together this, ki this kind, this way to make a, a, a staircase. At the end, it is, I think, the best way ever find to make a staircase in terms of saving the material because you, you have a, um, a computer work because you can imagine all the, as a wage, any wage is placed on the real line surface. So, so you have to find all this line. But at the end, when you make this hole and you catch it and you break and open it, if the stone is good and you don't break everything and you have the knowledge for that, you save two stone. If, you, if any time you make a staircase, you have 40% of wastage immediately, immediately. Here we have near nothing, maybe two or, or three percent because we have the cross to do here. So, so it was once very interesting and two, it, it's, uh, it is a super nice surface at the end with impossible to do in, in uh, another way. So here, to make it simple for, for people, if you see the stone with here, it's exactly the same one with here. It is only altern intern angles. Mirrored, inverted, yeah. Yeah, near and inverted, yeah, exactly. And it is elliptic. The, the plan is elliptic. Uh, I mean, so it's, it's, it's quite yeah. complicated, the surface well very interesting to do and match very well for with the smashing concrete uh, where it is everywhere under so in that case as i said i mean there is a part with flying and there is different uh, technique to catch the stone together when you want to make it flying you you can only glue and, and pin it together if you don't have so much uh, distance, so much solicitation and so, or you can pre, pre or post stress it. Means that you will insert a cable in between two stone and to give some forces. And we make this many time. Uh, for example, uh, the first one we make was in two, 2002 or three, I don't remember, at uh, Biennale de Venise. We have an obelisk we, we, we was 16 meter high and uh, it was a soft stone so it didn't have a lot of weight and the wind was a problem so we make a pressurization until the weight of the granite and it being stable so so it, it is on uh, pre-stress or post-stressing it is um, a tool used with the other to make the stone uh, stable this um, is the, our mention at, uh, at Atelier Romeo. It was, um, it, is, it is a patented process and it is uh, a way to save uh, material in general. Um, basically, we use stone, stone, and a concrete on the center. And it is a fiber reinforced concrete. Um, we also do this with stone, 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 and glue together. And it is the way we do here. Um, this is the, the work we've, we do. It is, it is at least, it is uh, really first pieces come outside our, our workshop made with this method. And it was for the Biennale de Venise. And um, there are three sheets of stone glued together at the beginning, they are flat, and we mold it on the floor. So this allows to use all the stone, well, maybe the rest of something, maybe, I mean, to make it all together and to make super uh, interesting structure in terms of, of uh, viewing and in terms of uh, possibility. And at the end, when you ask, uh, for example, for cladding or uh, facade cladding in stone, as soon as you go with big panels, you need to make a little stone and to glue it on, uh, on aluminum or something like this. So um, this is a really more interesting process in terms of, uh, of uh, distance, in terms of working, in terms of body together. 
So it is under the canopy. And this is the canopy. So this is what we installed in, uh, in, uh, in Venice. It is a five meter uh, long cone. And uh, it is always, all, all the time, the same pieces. And um, in, in a way, on in uh, other. Partly acting in tension. So the bottom of the cone is actually um, in tension because it's this laminated material, as it were. Yeah. But this year, this the, the next Venice one you're going to show us, you're, you're, you're collaborating with somebody else doing something far more spectacular. Yeah. I think this is coming now. Yeah. This is uh, um, the next, I would say. It is, it is the material, it is the first image I show you. It is our um, the product we are under development, and it is really interesting because it is uh, really modular. I mean, we because we use concrete on the center, we can model this concrete in terms of uh, solicitation, as the concrete is done in a, in a construction. I mean, if you make a bridge or if you, if you make a wall, you have two different kind of uh, concrete and uh, our material and uh, still work and so and so. And we make exactly um, the same um, advantage on this product because we make UHPC concrete. So we have a, a, a really, really um, deep and dense concrete, really hard. And, and, and we pour this in, um, into our, our two um, sheet of stone and we do this flat and we mold it. So, so we don't have any uh, limit on distance and form in reality. As soon as, soon as we have the knowledge to uh, do a good concrete and, uh, and to place it on, on the good form, it is all uh, a question of, uh, of know-how, really. So here you see it's quite solid, so you can jump on the, on the street with it and place it everywhere. <laughs> it's not a big problem. And here they are placed uh, in our workshop and they are waiting for the top part or under the, uh, the working site to make this at the end. This is made by, they are tensile vault. So uh, the material on that point, it's used by the, the architect with Luca Poyan to this best um, solicitation. I mean, as you see here, you have a, a surface with a flight and tiny and and and, uh, um, and tensile structure. I mean, you 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 take the stone flat and you mold it on a, on the surface who has no uh, uh, no flat origin at the end. It is a tensile one. So so we use the. the the stone and we use the way we are molding it to share the tensility and the deplacement of the of the ships and 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 the process allow us to do that i mean we are we are not um cutting everything the final form and to have a massive wastage we have a very a sheet of paper and we use the sheet of paper with quite elastic to place it on the form. So, so this 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 um, option. I mean, you've got three layers, yeah. Both layers on the outside of your 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 whichever stone you choose uh, comes in small pieces, as it were, broken like almost mm -hmm. like a mosaic, but yeah. kept in kept in a in a bag, laid yeah. over laid over whatever mold you've created out of whatever material. What, exactly. how, how thick is that sort of mosaic of stone? Is it? I right? mean, the, we, we can um, modulate the thickness. We, so we don't have any problem for that. We can, the, we can... Yeah, depends on the structure. So in this case, because the, the Venice one that we did was only, what, what was that? Was that this 10, was 10, 10, 10, and a half, if I remember. Right, okay. so 25 mil. and a half, something like right, 25 okay. milli. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. And this one is uh, 35, 35 right, okay. milli. All right, so is that... 10, 15, 10. Sorry, that's 25. Do you say? This one say, is, uh, yes, yeah, seven, 35? seven, and the, the rest in between. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. 
and and yeah. uh, again we can we can make the thickness we like at the, okay. at, at the end he sure have a limit we didn't reach now oh. due to our process but uh, oh. uh, we'll progress on it for the moment we are using a tiny layer maybe 40 milli or something like this to have the, the good equi equilibrium between the the quality in surface and the structure and yeah the the, the point is that we can use this for a structure a self yeah, sure, stable like structure a, but yeah, we can yeah. also use this for pouring con concrete for example and th this is also oh i see what you mean now so effectively it becomes permanent i, I was wondering what you meant when you're pouring concrete mm -hmm. right so this becomes can you effectively turn it into permanent formwork mm -hmm. for something like a major piece of infrastructure so if this, for instance, could be the, 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 the form that a, a road bridge might take uh, that you then pour your concrete and reinforcement into. Yeah, exactly. So you've got permanent formwork. But otherwise, in and of itself, it holds itself up. And if an architect or somebody else can make use of it, then great. Yeah. I see where you're heading with that. Okay, yeah. all right. All right. Yeah. We, 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 we touch with this kind of... Yeah. Uh, of uh, reused matter we we, we touch from the design to the superstructure yeah okay so yeah let's have a a new pass in the story so you want me, you want me well you sorry you want <laughs> are you going to talk about abbe <laughs> Yes, you, get, you go. You, you sort of yeah, so let me, uh, I think, uh, because there are actually a couple of questions also from the audience, yeah. um, I think we, we should probably, because um, we have been so like talking now for an hour and a half, give yeah. the chance uh, to the audience to also ask a couple of questions. Yeah. But uh, please continue. <laughs> I, I, I finish this one? Yeah, go on. Okay. So. This is a turn on the pass. On the pass. This is um, a structure which comes directly from the wood knowledge and the, and the what can we say? Um, wow, well, I have a whole a minute. Um, yeah, you don't want you don't want to give us your full PhD. <laughs> if I if I <laughs> if I jump in and just cut you, <laughs> allow you to go to the next slide. Uh, yeah. It's essentially a reciprocal structure. So uh, where you want to span a large area, but you don't have the pieces of stone or timber to do it, you, you work out the geometry of those so they can rest on one another and span, take that span. And this is, you know, this is from, what is it, 250 odd years ago. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then you guys have uh, played with that with your, I don't know which bit of software you've used here and made yeah, it. Yeah, this one's Mathematica, this yeah, one. Yeah, made it a reality, yeah. A contemporary reality, yeah. and you're, yeah, it, it, it is a reciprocal structure. Uh, yeah. uh, at the end, is a yeah. apply and sustain, apply and sustain, and apply and sustain. And you have this work on um, on wood, and uh, Leonardo da Vinci make uh, uh, many type of them. And um, yeah, we we developed this uh, idea with um, Joel Sakharovich in GSA for years to use flat uh, structure to test the bay world. We, we make some sample with the school, we crash everything, we test the resistance. It was really, really interesting for years. And um, an architect who was working on parametric um, staff with uh, Giuseppe Falacara from Bari, it is a university near to us. He, he, he tried to make with uh, 3D Max at the, at the beginning uh, a deformation. And, and we make uh, the first uh, cylindrical uh, board. And after we play and play and play and make a code. And here it is a code with, uh, made by Mathematica was uh, uh, there is a quite hard parametric software from the CERA uh, in France. And, um, and, the, and the, my professor in GSA makes the, the, the code. And so... Uh, could you mute yourself? Sorry. If we Sorry, it. that's me. That's me. Oh. I don't hear you. You hear me? Okay, I always speak alone. So don't worry. I don't hear you again. No problem. We have a speak. And uh, yeah, so about this uh, building, we have the chains with quite uh, extremely 
rare and interesting uh, chains for a researcher, that's we made it. So these are the calculation was made directly from the code. And as you, you, you see, it is a reciprocal structure and it, it, it turned on. I mean, it, it, this young and young, you see, it is uh, the release as, as soon as you catch off the, the support. So quite interesting to see that. And this is a realization. So it is quite a big vault. It is seven meter wide. So it, it is a 35 ton of stone. So it is, it is a big thing. And you see, um, it is true and, and really reciprocal. I mean, joint are only uh, placed together with mortar on the, on the polyethylene mold. And this are, uh, it is a result at the end. So it's, it's really interesting in terms of uh, poetry and geometry. And it, it, it is pure uh, algorithmic geometry. So in terms of algorithm and, and, and the very interesting way we have to use computing and craft, I show you first the, the query and I show you again the query with a robot. I mean, here we have a massive mega block and you see the spots were everywhere and the spots are there for reference and, and the robot is turning around the, the, the stone to shape. And some, someone, we use exactly the same robot because you see here, it is here and the people it is inside the, the tooth we say of the robot and there is a wire, cable wire here. And at the same idea that would make a bay and the same idea of reciprocal vault, we have a, a reciprocal shape on, on, the, on the stone here. You see that's the why we make a cut, a cut, a cut, a cut, a cut. And you at the end, when you make the assembly, you, you have this possibility. And what it is interesting again, and what it is a very interesting camp in terms in term of research, is to find some, some uh, pieces who have different uh, used. I mean, here they are placed in a way and it, is a, and it is a wall with open. But if you place it on the other way and the wall is closed, I mean, this after it is research in architecture. But at the end, there is many, many possibility on parametric and on technology together to make some new uh, new invention. For example, this one is from the Ichiaka and I find it very, very interesting because it is the same wire than, than we see here, but here you see that the wire is straight, okay? And here by computer, the wire is not. So there is here a release of the tension in front of what you want to obtain with the cutting wire. So it is a really interesting point of view. After that, there is also another thing. Human brain, they can't, they can't figure this surface. I mean, here there is only one surface like this. Imagine if you, if, if you make the complication, if you make it in different, different shape, it, it will be very complicated. And here you will involve uh, artificial intelligence. But what it is interesting, it is to marry all these super uh, technology things like intelligence artificial and techniques and geometry and so and so and to exciting ourselves by that. But at the end, what is interesting is that there is a resistance, there is a machine, there is a diamond wire, there is tension, there is all these things together to make something interesting and to, again, say hello to the heart catch his material and same and made something with it. Right, and, uh, at the end I finish, look, it's, it's writing here. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. So again, you know, I really wish that we could have a, a, a round of applause. Um, that was uh, really, um, I, I uh, that was super interesting. I, um, I wish really that we could do this uh, next week again. <laughs> um, so, you know, unfortunately we have, um, we probably um, have maybe, unfortunately only maybe 10 uh, minutes for some questions. As I mentioned, there is actually a couple of questions from the audience, but you know, there's actually, um, you know, I'm, um, Maybe both of you can can give a um, um, a little bit of insight. Um, 
it, it seems to me that um, the the role of geometry really, particularly in in um, so like in modern times, really has become or basically became degenerated um, to a to a purely uh, to a role of basically just visualizing what is um, um, what is there, like in in, in maybe um, um, elevation section and plan. Um, but geometry really is sort of like the um, became a role of just representing what your design is rather than a um, so in, integral part of design. And I find the what I find super interesting in in both your work is that um, really it puts geometry uh, to the point where you say like no geometry and the knowledge about geometry is um, determines your repertoire of architectural form. And this is sort of like what you carry to a design problem, rather than you design something and geometry is only to make it look good, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, for, 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 yeah, go on. In, in, and it really sort of, the, 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 the role of an architect is not the one of actually building something. The role of the architect is the one that produces artifacts that describe what he wants to get built, right? So, so therefore your means to describe things is really determining what you actually, what your repertoire of architectural form could be. And, and you could, you could, yeah, you could limit your limit yourself by um, by a repertoire of of what you've learned in terms of drawing skills, geometric knowledge, etc. Um, that's no different from limiting yourself to to say copying a pattern language of classical details, you know, pasting those together and uh, according to various rules. You could limit yourself that way. Uh, but interestingly, I mean, if you if you look at uh, uh, the examples that um, Luke used um, from from whether it's the 16th century all the way to the 18th century, you, you, these are uh, including in Italy as well, of course. So you know, you look at Brunelleschi or even um, Borromini. These are people who, who who famously understood the nature of gravity, the stone they're working with, and uh, uh, and bricks, of how to how to um, uh, use the geometry as well as cut that stone and brick and form them to, to hold up essentially a building and therefore um, uh, generate the architecture out of that. So it, it's, it's, it's geometry that was integral to the physical requirements um, of, um, of, uh, of, that, of that material uh, to, to aim towards the, the ambition they had in terms of whether it's spanning a dome or, or a structure. Before you answer, Luke, could you maybe stop sharing your screen because that would allow yeah, yeah, the course, course. I, I tried to do that. Uh, how can we do that? Uh, wait up. Ah, I return to Zoom. Yeah. No. Milko, do you know? Uh, no. Because I can't take it away from you. <laughs> Sorry for that. Uh, there is post share, but it's not a good one. Stop share. Okay. Stop this share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, Luke. Go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, the, 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 the geometry, geometry as, as, I, as I told before, the geometry is the language. And I mean, you, the architect can decide perfectly if he, if he know what is he talk, talking about and also if he don't i mean he can he can decide to impose it to you he can, mm -hmm. he can say okay this is what i want to do okay i don't ask anything from you and i want this okay so just execute and please and mm -hmm. yeah it's the same at the end he just give me something with clear and there is another way with what is what is something we can share what what is what is what are you doing here? What, what, what are your craft? Are you able to share something with me or not? Because it's also possible as it's not the answer. So if you are able to share something, maybe we can have a talk. And, and, and so the process can be a creation in that way. 
And from century was another way where the craftsman come to the architect and say, listen, you know nothing and I know, so I will project for you. And, and it was a shame and a, and, and a big problem for many times and it's still sometimes like this. But it is a language, like parameterization. I mean, a parametric architect, remember, they, they speak about parametry. They, they speak about creating something, but they are both architects. But if they find someone who is involved in the idea of parametric, maybe they can share another kind of language. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important for craftsmen people, any, any work they do. I mean, excuse me, but a robot, it is the same for steel, glass, concrete, stone, mm. it is the same. It is the same machine and speak different language. Mm. So as soon as you know how to have a discussion with your machine, you can also have a discussion with architect who is more easy at the end. Mm. Um, um, yes, this is a point on the, on, the, on the applying of geometry in our discussion, in the process of creativity. So there is actually, you know, I, I, I feel, I mean, like I could sit here forever and, you know, but um, um, I want to also maybe pose some questions um, from, from the YouTube um, stream. So Victor Sadenberg, he's asking, um, uh, look, uh, look, you, um, if you think that um, in comparison to previous periods that um, sharing knowledge about geometry uh, but like, what's sort of like your take on sharing knowledge and sharing geometric knowledge um, in comparison to previous times? Um, what role open source tools uh, might play in internet um, forums? Because you know the question, you know, you you posed that question before that it's it is sort of like secret knowledge, right? It's like it's um, it is um, really it's a proprietary and um, secret knowledge. Um, some people refer to it as uh, as the holy grail, <laughs> the, the the knowledge the knowledge to of building uh, cathedrals. Um, so, how do you? What's your take on on that? Well, uh, it is it is a uh, we didn't extend really much on what it is the geometry. We just give a face mm -hmm. on uh, the, the sharing and the discussion can be between architect and uh, craftsman people, but it is really far than this at the end. If I can give uh, just a compare, okay, just a compare. If, if you take the, the BIM, building uh, informative management, okay. You have many craftsmen, they, are, they don't know how to use that thing, the super, and there are many architects, they don't know how to use this thing. I mean, that's, that's, that's a crazy word as soon as you don't know how to speak the language. And Philippe Bertelon makes the same thing. He say, listen guys, we work together, we understand each other. And the, and the, and, and the beam is this. You, you have no choice to, to, to to don't present what you are doing, to don't uh, calculate what you are doing. You, you, you can't go through there. No, no, this is number, this is a file, this is a form, and it is the same one for everyone. So the geometry, as soon as it's shared between people, it is a language, and it is also a tool of control. Mm -hmm, totally. Control of who are doing what. So, in terms of secret, when you see the secret of the cathedral and all the stuff around, yeah, there is one group of people, they have one group of knowledge, and they educate their own people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you see it in that way, you understand that what did they do? I mean, from the Gothic to the, from the Roman to the Gothic flamboyant, it is the same language, there is different tools. For geometric advancement, attention, I, I, I don't say they didn't invent anything far away from the idea. I mean, they make something very interesting, but they go on the moon at the end. They, they just 
in vent n, then to an objective to go higher and higher and, and to preserve themselves and the knowledge they are themselves to show to the others as they have the best knowledge themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's like the Russian and the American at the end, you know, it is, it is, it is, it is nothing very interesting in terms of um, architecture at the end. The Gothic world, it is dramatic, it is incredible, it is wow everywhere, but at the end it is all the same language. There, there is not, uh, mm -hmm. there is not a deep, um, uh, how can I say, there is not a deep sharing Mm -hmm. is, is this heart, this architecture don't share with people. Mm -hmm. They share with themselves. And, 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 uh, and when, you, when you see the cathedral, it is perfect. It is beautiful. It is what you want. Mm -hmm. But at the end, it is secret. And, and so in terms of uh, you think, you think a new it, architect, it was difficult. You think it's as secret as it was before the revolution? I mean, presumably that's why they broke it up at the time of the revolution. It's as secret as that now, today, you think? More so? Um, no, but like I would, I, would, I would say, though, that, the, um, that um, regardless, you know, for example, the, the foundation of Geary Technologies, right? That was so like Frank Geary's arm to be the one at the table who knows the most about his own projects. So he wanted to be not... Yeah. forced into any decisions by by partners he always wanted to be the one in terms of geometry he knew that he was the one who knew the most about it yeah. Yeah. and to develop that knowledge within their company was very valuable and it's maybe not so much about um, secrecy or being open source but it's about so like you just need to be ahead of the game yeah you know? yeah. yeah 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 so you can't be fooled yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, so many people told Frank Geary, we can't do this. And then yeah. he would go and say, like, no, you can't. <laughs> you know? yeah. Um, yeah. Anyways, so I, you know, because there are actually more questions and I, you know, I don't want to, um, there seems to be, and we, I don't know, we will find a format to continue this conversation because I think it's way too um, interesting. And um, regardless, there seems to be a little bit of an appetite um, I mean, for some Clerkenwell gossip. <laughs> well, far, far away, I'll, I'll try and um, satisfy it. Um, because, you know, I think particularly the Clerkenwell project was a little, um, you know, caused so much press mm -hmm. for you and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and also controversy. Can you maybe, because you didn't touch upon it, but it seems in the stream and in the comments that there is like, there's some appetite for gossip. Yeah. Can you sort of like give an update? Yeah, so um, for those of you who, um, who don't know, um, as soon as we finish the project, pretty much as soon as we finish the project, um, a councillor, so it's a, a local government um, elected councillor, uh, uh, started a campaign to get it demolished. And it was just all a bit of a shock to us. Uh, and uh, the press being what it is, architectural press as well as local press, uh, asked me for a right to reply. And I said, well, this is very odd. I'm not sure what it's based on. Um, uh, here are the documents proving that we have all the official um, uh, 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 information to allow it to be built. Um, and, uh, and th in addition to that, the councillor turns out to be he sits on the planning department, so the, the body within the local authority that passes everything. But he never saw it because this was done by the bureaucrats alone. It was not, not, didn't need to go to any councillors to sign off. And he embarrassingly uh, said, I should have seen this. Uh, I never saw it, therefore I didn't pass it, and therefore it can't possibly be legal. In addition, I am a, um, uh, an architectural technician, and I can tell you that this building is made of concrete. This is all fake stone this story that it holds up the building as an exoskeleton is all rubbish. Uh, fortunately, the press being what it is, gave me a right to reply. I replied and said, well, you know, first of all, he's uh, not very well qualified as a planner, as a councillor who sits on the planning department because, you know, this is done by the bureaucracy, delegated powers. And secondly, as an architectural technician, what's equally unqualified because anybody, even a first-year graduate watching the building go up would understand. And this highly embarrassed him. 
So, you know, perhaps the lesson at the end of all this was um, uh, 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 just keep your mouth shut and hopefully the thing will go away. But anyway, it so embarrassed him that he instructed a, an enforcement officer to remove the, uh, all the original drawings uh, and construct a new planning application uh, that demonstrated that um, uh, from previous drawings that we'd um, sent the planners, that, that the building as built is not what should have been built. Yeah. This is highly mysterious to us. And I thought, well, well yeah, you know, being, being like most of us, um, um, deferring to authority, I thought, well, I must have done something wrong. You know, must, must be. All this, the small changes that we made in discussions must be our fault because the authorities are telling us we definitely don't have a legal right to build this. Uh, they said they've spoken to the planning department. They've spoken to the case officers. They've taken legal advice. There must be some legal technicality that we've completely missed. And it's a total disaster. The building is going to get demolished. And uh, two years of this mayhem. Uh, uh, and then finally it gets to what's called an appeal. Uh, but the appeal is allows our side, our, our legal team, to cross-examine the, um, the, uh, the, the enforcement officer that was required, that was instructed by the councillor to, 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 um, to remove these drawings. And, uh, you know, I didn't know any of this at the time. I just sat there while he's being cross-examined and he was asked, we notice in your evidence, you are missing certain drawings and documents that there's a piece of paper signed by planners that shows they should be there. Where are they? Uh, uh, he's under cross-examination, so strictly speaking, if he lies, he can get six years in prison yeah, because it's it's perjury to the to the court. So this is, you know, he has to tell the truth, and the truth he, he, he confesses. I, I removed these drawings as I was confused. Uh, why were you confused? Well, I was instructed that this that this should be a, a smaller building made of brick. Uh, this is one of um, Amin's um, original uh, ideas. You know, we, we basically presented a number of iterations, load bearing, uh, mixtures of materials, etc., and got approval for some of them. Uh, and uh, the councillor wants this one. And, you know, therefore, I removed these drawings that refer to a stone building because I was confused. OK, thank you for telling us that. That explains why those drawings are missing. In your confusion, did it occur to you to ask the uh, planning, uh, the original case officers in the planning department? Uh, no, no, I didn't. I didn't. You know, wh whether they'd given approval for a stone building? No, no, I didn't. Okay, so if we put all those buildings back, uh, drawings back in, does the building uh, is it in breach of the material, i.e., limestone? Uh, no. Is it in breach of the height? No. Is it in breach of the plan? No. Is it in breach of the finishes, the different types of you know uh, saw cut, cleavage? drilled no uh, so it's not in breach in any of these then so therefore there's no there's no need for the uh, notice to demolish no okay did it occur to you to take legal advice before issuing this notice no uh, did you um, do you know you've broken several points of law in 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 issuing the notice no i don't i i, I didn't know that yeah so i'm on the other side of this um uh, this court as it were uh, and all i'm thinking is that maybe i i'd be forgiven if I just you know, calmly walked across, picked him up by the lapels and just tossed him out the window, because that would, you know, I, I think most people would understand my, uh, my frustration with that. So, yeah, no, their, their, their case then collapsed, obviously. But it was, a, yeah, it was a complete shock to find, uh, and obviously disillusioning. I mean, maybe I shouldn't be so damn naive um, that... Uh, that uh, you know, how can you say it? You can't mince your words. I should be more diplomatic, but it's an abuse of power by one councillor who felt he was humiliated. He ought to um, uh, uh, maintain his position because he was going for promotion to become head of planning committee um, uh, and uh, instructing an enforcement officer who then unquestioningly does this because he, he's under the impression it'll, you know, he'll be protected by the councillor. At the end of all this, I say, well, you know, he's broken several points of law, caused me endless misery. Um, what, what's the next step? And he said, well, th this appeal is only to demonstrate that you had planning. The fact that somebody else broke the law doesn't matter. You know, you've just demonstrated you have planning. The next step is for you to spend some money in, in, in a civil um, claim against, um, against the um, enforcement officer and the councillor and the whole borough 
for employing these people. So yeah, I don't know. I'm not gonna, you know, my the advice I've got from lots of other architects is if you want to spend the next five years several hours a week writing documents, preparing your case, then go ahead. Uh, you might get tens of millions of pounds in five or six or seven years time, or you could just return to, 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 to doing your working as an architect. Yeah. 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 Anyway, that's probably answered. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that, that, that's sort of like um, that. Um, yeah. Enough for, have, for yeah. the appetite of, uh, yeah. of gossip. Yeah. Yeah, um, exactly. You know, so I think we are, we are reaching uh, two hours. Uh, Mirko, um, oh, there is one, there is one maybe with a, with, a, with a quick answer. So there is actually a, a great excitement in the, in the YouTube um, uh, stream um, um, about, um, so basically inquiring about how, what would be your advice, Luke, to, um, if somebody is interested in what you present in terms of geometry and, uh, and stone cutting, what would be the right uh, way to to sort of like find an entry into um, quarry ex like quarry experimentation or um... email him? Come in, Bull. Yeah. No. Do you, uh... a, do you have a do you have a sort of like a quick advice for students who are interested? in this line of inquiry? Yeah, I mean, um, just go inquiry. I mean, just just find a, um, a company who sell uh, blocks and go inquiry. I mean, it is it is different world. I mean, the, the quarry and the stone masonry. The, the, the quarry, they, they extract and they sell blocks. That's what they do. But it's extremely interesting to, to see the way that's uh, how it's done and in different material. and. Quarry mm. people are, are, are generally simple people. They are, they are kind and they are hard workers. So, so you, you don't have to be afraid to do that. You just go on the, uh, knock on the door and say, listen, I'm a student in architecture. I want to, to, to learn the stone. I mean, <laughs> for okay. a quarry, it's, it's, uh, it's white bread. So, so, so just do it. And, and after that, you have, you have the craftsman and, and you have the stone masonry company and they are of, of course, marble is everywhere, tile is, is, is everywhere, mm -hmm. so it's quite hard to find a stone masonry uh, company. So, so this you can, if you have the chance. Maybe... So in Germany, there is there is a, 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 a nice craftsmanship in uh, Germany. So, yeah. so yeah, Steinmetz and, and just go. Steinmetz, exactly. <laughs> Cool. So we are reaching now because we started 15 minutes late, but we are reaching so like the end with two hours, which is very uh, uh, unusual, particularly on a nice summer uh, uh, evening. Um, I'm again, like I, I couldn't be more thrilled about this. Um, it was extremely um, insightful and exciting. And I really hope also from uh, the, the students and those who listened on YouTube live stream that um, the fact that they stayed stayed uh, with us for so long is a is a really um, is a is a what do you say um, basically shows that you know it was a very fascinating uh, conversation and th this is really thanks to you both um, if there was a if there was a another way to do a round of applause <laughs> it's like watching these like late night shows without um, without audience <laughs> okay. um, let's uh, let's please be in touch um, and um, hopefully uh, we can continue that conversation at, at um, some other point okay good thank Great you pleasure. thank you for asking thank you us very, very much thank, yeah. you, well, thank you to everybody for listening yeah thank you to bye -bye. all students and everyone thank yeah. you bye thank you so much <laughs> Right.